Babies open their eyes pretty much immediately after birth. They can see right away and even though they don't perceive very sharp images, they can identify faces early on. Newborn mice or experimental animals are blind for the first two weeks of their lives. Yet, when they open their eyes and start interacting with their environments, neurons in the hippocampus, for example, or the visual system, compute information pretty much like in the adult. These facts raise the question of how the brain gets wired up without prior experience to make sense of what's happening in the outside world. An interesting observation has been that the developing brain is spontaneously active even before sensory experience drives their activity. And this spontaneous activity may help wiring up the brain but just simulating activity patterns that would occur later in life through sensory experience. In a previous study, we used calcium imaging in slices to map the synaptic inputs of hippocampal neurons. And we found that these inputs are not randomly organized. In fact, neighboring synapses are frequently co-active, indicating that they are clustered. The aim of the present study was to find a plasticity mechanism that sets up clustered synaptic connectivity. First, we investigated whether synapse activity is also clustered in the visual cortex during development. To do this, we performed in vivo whole cell recordings and imaged the dendrites of layer 2 3 neurons during the second postnatal week. Here is an example recording where you can see synaptic calcium signals superimposed on the dendrite in pseudocolor. Traces of the three sites and the voltage clamp recording are shown on the right. During the middle burst, the three marked sites are active at the same time. When we analysed the activity in many cells, we found that neighbouring sites were frequently coactive, so clustering is also present in the visual cortex during development. We also observed that individual sites showed unique variations in their activity over time, and we wondered whether coactivity with neighbouring sites could regulate activity. We found that those sites that were out of sync with their neighbours became down-regulated. Specifically, sites with low coactivity showed a reduction in their activity frequency. We observed that the depression of out-of-sync synapses was not accompanied with a change in their amplitude. We therefore hypothesized that this depression actually reflected a change in the transmission efficiency or the success rate of a synapse. We decided to test this idea by stimulating individual synapses in hippocampal slices while recording the presence or absence of a corresponding postsynaptic response in order to calculate the synaptic success rate. We found that the success rate of synapses that were stimulated out of sync with other activity on the dendrite underwent a significant reduction. Our previous observations made us suspect that this reduction was actually due to a lack of local coactivity with nearby synapses. To further examine this possibility, we developed a closed loop paradigm to stimulate individual synapses in response to spontaneous activity occurring on the dendrite. As expected, we found that synapses that were stimulated in synchrony with nearby spontaneous activity remained stable, while locally desynchronized synapses underwent a significant reduction in their synaptic success rate. Understanding the molecular mechanisms behind our observations has always been very important to us, and neurotrophins as promoters of survival and differentiation have elicited a great deal of scientific interest due to their potent actions at quite low concentrations. But in addition, more recently it has been shown that the pro-forms of neurotrophins like pro-BDNF can have negative effects. Therefore, we set out to test the role of pro-BDNF and P75 signaling in desynchronization-induced depression of synaptic transmission. What we found was that in the absence of P75 signaling, desynchronized synapses could not get depressed anymore, demonstrating the punishing effects of pro-BDNF. We next wondered if this mechanism is important for synaptic clustering and indeed by amplifying pro-BDNF P75 signaling we could reduce coactivity levels of neighboring synapses. Taking our findings together, we can now propose the following model for synaptic clustering by spontaneous activity. Here you see three neighboring synapses located on the dendrite of a cell. Two of these synapses are often coactive and their transmission efficiency remains stable. However, the third synapse is out of sync with its neighbors, which leads to locally elevated levels of pro-BDNF. As a result, the success rate of this synapse is decreased, which makes it more susceptible to synaptic pruning. Over time, this out-of-sync looser link mechanism drives the functional clustering of coactive synapses on the dendrite. Since synaptic clustering has been linked to sensory processing in adulthood, these findings suggest a new mechanism by which spontaneous activity prepares the brain for future sensory processing.